Playing review, print speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Q in review. That is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at qinreview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Appeal decision revealed for the Socky Hall Street Marks and Spencer site. An article written by Stuart Patterson and Xander Elliots. A council decision to refuse a previous application to demolish the old Marks and Spencer store on Socky Hall Street and build student flats has been overturned. The plan was initially refused for reasons including being too tall and a second revised bid was submitted, which was then approved. The developers, Fusion Students, appealed the original decision at the same time as it put in the revised application. The ruling by the Scottish Government Planning and Environment Appeals Division means that there are now two proposals with consent and the developer is considering which one to take forward. An 18-storey block was ruled out for reasons including the impact on the conservation area and the height of the development at 57 metres tall. The plan would have kept the familiar Art Deco facade onto Socky Hall Street. The appeal was successful, with the Scottish Government Appeals Division ruling that the MNS building is of little townscape, architectural or historic interest, other than it being designed for Marks & Spencer by J.M. Munro and Partners using a modular facade system devised by Robert Lutyens. The ruling stated, the appeal site contributes little to the character or appearance of the conservation area, other than its facade, which would be retained and in reinforcing the grid and block pattern of streets. In its vacant and closed state, the building detracts from the area at present. The second application, approved in May this year, was for a 14-storey block and an increase to 15% affordable accommodation on the site. The developers' fusion group are now considering their options over which plan to pursue. Brodie Berman, Senior Acquisitions Associate at the Fusion Group, said We are pleased to note the successful outcome of our appeal for our original proposals to redevelop the former Marks & Spencer store on Soggy Hall Street. Despite the disappointing decision by the City's Planning Committee in November last year, we've always believed that our proposals aligned with the needs and aspirations of the City. We're delighted that the merits of the scheme have now been recognised by the Scottish Government. Over the coming weeks, we'll be exploring our options as we move forward with one of our recently approved schemes, ensuring the delivery of a development that will make a positive difference to Socky Hall Street, whilst also serving as a catalyst to wider regeneration in the heart of the city centre. Glasgow City Council did not wish to comment on the decision. An article written by Stuart Patterson and Sander Elliotts. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Billy Connolly makes an honest admission about death. An article written by Emilia Kettle. Legendary comic Sir Billy Connolly has opened up about facing death and living with Parkinson's. The Scottish star revealed that he'd seen the funny side to death and has come to term with his illness. Sir Billy was diagnosed with prostate cancer and Parkinson's on the same day in 2013 and has since recovered from the cancer. Now in a new BBC show, Sir Billy is opening up about his life and health struggles in a series called In My Own Words. Speaking on the show, Sir Billy shares how he laughed off his diagnosis. Yes, it was a funny week I had. On the Monday, I had hearing aids. On the Tuesday, I got pills for heartburn, which I have to take all the time. And on the Wednesday, I got news that I had prostate cancer and Parkinson's. 
The doctors told me on the phone, look, we've had the results and it is cancer. I said, oh, nobody has ever said that to me before. Revealing the first thing his wife did, Sir Billy added, my wife, Pamela Stevenson, was standing behind me and gave me a cuddle. I was not unduly worried. Sir Billy had previously joked in an interview with The Mirror that his Parkinson's must have been caused by appearing on Michael Parkinson's chat show so much. Telling the paper, I just thought, I've got Parkinson's. I wish he, Michael, had kept it to himself. It was easy making fun of it. You just confront it and make decisions based on it. You just have to think. Don't think you're being badly treated in life or you've had the bad pick of the straws. You're just one of millions. Just behave yourself and relax. You then realise death is not the big thing everyone has made it out to be. It's nothing. It's just a sudden nothing. The BBC's new show will see Sir Billy discuss his friendship with comic Robin Williams, open up about his struggles with alcohol and his thoughts on how good he is as a father. The comic will also share what it was like growing up in Glasgow in poverty, sharing that he and his siblings had to sleep in a recess off the kitchen and wash in the kitchen sink. It was not a happy time. It was a dark time. It was very violent and I was beaten up by my aunts. It had a profound influence on me. I felt kind of abandoned as a child and trapped. I was brought up in a home and it was hellish. It was not the way to treat children. It's funny to hear people talk about children today when they say it's not right to hit a child, but a little slap. It doesn't work. It was cruel and it was not right. I was longing to be an adult. I kept thinking, where is all the fun? I read books at school where children were having fun with their parents. But for me, it was not there. Billy Connolly, in my own words, starts on BBC One on Monday, September the 2nd at 10.40pm. An article written by Emilia Kettle. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Bin strike called off as union accepts pay deal, but warns over blame game. An article written by Stuart Patterson. Union members have accepted an improved pay offer that calls off planned bid strikes. Almost 8 out of 10 GMB members voted to approve the deal, which offers 5.6% for council workers. Following the result, the union warned ministers not to blame spending cuts on public sector pay deals. The deal gives a minimum rise of 3.6% for all council grades, but waited to give full-time frontline staff a rise of £1,292, equivalent to 5.6% for the lowest paid. GMB had planned to call out cleansing and waste staff on strike over the pay dispute with Cosler, the body representing Scotland's councils. The strike action was suspended while members were balloted on the deal, and it's now been called off. The union said there should not have been delays to reaching an acceptable offer. Keir Greenaway, GMB Scotland senior organiser in public services, said... Council leaders' lack of urgency and stubborn refusal to ask the Scottish Government for support meant that negotiations and uncertainty went on far longer than necessary. It should not take imminent strike action to deliver a fair offer, but while it came too late, the deal was above inflation for all staff and waited to benefit frontline workers most. That was what the unions had asked for, and given that, it is no surprise that our members accepted it. With spending cuts expected, the union said the reason is not to fund fair pay deals for public workers. Mr Greenaway added, Ministers implying a fair pay offer for our members means cuts to spending are only diverting attention from the real cause of the crisis in our public services. We have endured more than a decade of cuts, not because of staff being paid fairly, but because our governments at Westminster and at Holyrood have failed to properly fund the public sector. Government is about choices, but when our public services are struggling to recruit and retain skilled staff, paying council staff fairly is not part of the problem, but part of the solution. An article written by Stuart Patterson. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Plan for a green hydrogen plant is met with concerns. An article written by Emily Moore. 
a public consultation on Ochentoshan Distillery's plans to use hydrogen as a fuel source was met with concern by residents. Proposals for a green hydrogen site that is said to decarbonise the whisky production at the distillery on Great Western Road were met with concern at the event in their visitor centre. Residents from the homes next to the distillery say they're worried about the impact that the new site would have, including the stability of hydrogen, potential impacts on health and the devaluation of their properties. The plans are in the consultation stage and are due to be submitted to Western Bartonshire Council in November. At the event on Thursday, a group of residents was given an opportunity to talk with those involved in the process and voice their worries. However, a reporter from the Clydebank Post was not allowed in at this stage. An online petition against the proposals so far has received 362 signatures within six days of it being started. Following the meeting, one local resident said, I just get the impression that what they've done is over and above what they have to do. Do they think it's just going to go ahead and that we're wasting our time? I look right onto the fields. We're all in a stretch of houses. I'm about 93 metres from where this is going to be. It's an unproven technique. They keep saying it's cutting edge, and all I hear is experimental. Hydrogen is highly explosive. Think of the Hindenburg disaster. I came here to listen to what they had to say, but the next time I'll have more questions. Another local said, We're not against going green. We just don't want it on our doorstep. We asked them questions and they couldn't give us answers. They're telling us it doesn't put up emissions. They say it'll bring 130 new jobs, but it's not. They're just construction jobs. Apparently it'll only create three or four jobs. It's not bringing anything to the community. Along with these concerns was a worry about the safety of using hydrogen. One resident told the Post, It's a massive safety issue. They've been experimenting with cars for years and there's no way past what happens if they crash. There's evidence that nitric oxide, respiratory exposure, can be associated with asthma, heart disease, diabetes and more. What's the blast radius for it? They say they're going to build four metre walls around the site and how is that going to look? Concerns over whether the hydrogen would produce nitric oxide is disputed by the distillery. Suzanne Wilson, project manager, said, We are one of the first to go into planning to decarbonise whisky production. We wanted to let the public know and let them have an opportunity to come down and see what it's about. It's the most important part to consult the public. We're working towards community engagement. We're not even at the design stage yet, so this is really early on that we're getting the community involved. They did feasibility studies on types of renewables, and hydrogen was the most acceptable. We're just switching from natural gas to hydrogen. It will improve emission standards for the distillery. It's costing the distillery more to do this, and they want to demonstrate longevity in the community. Hydrogen has been used in industry for a hundred years. It's not a new gas. It feels new because it hasn't been used in this way. We're used to working within the standards and including safety processes. It's very closely monitored and carefully engineered. We wouldn't put a site here if we thought there was a safety risk. An article written by Emily Moore. Glasgow Times. News. On Friday the 30th of August. Detection dogs sniff out thousands of illicit cigarettes at two shops. An article written by Gillian McPherson. A total of 4,400 illegal cigarettes and 6.5 kilograms of hand-rolling tobacco suspected to be counterfeit have been seized from two shops in East Renfrewshire. Tobacco detection dogs Rosie and Boo from Consumer Protection Dogs UK helped the Council's Trading Standards Team and Police Scotland find the illicit tobacco when they visited premises across the area. The Springer Spaniel Rosie and German Wirehead Pointer Labrador Boo are both specifically trained to find nicotine produce. They assisted officers to make the recoveries during the searches, which otherwise would not have been visible during a routine inspection. Councillor Danny Devlin, convener for Environment and Housing, said This is a great example of partnership working between the Council, Police Scotland and Consumer Protection Dogs UK. The trade in illegal tobacco harms local communities and affects honest businesses operating within the law. 
Trading Standards and Police Scotland's work is playing a significant role in disrupting this unlawful trade and is helping to take illegitimate tobacco products off our local streets. East Renfrewshire Council has not provided any further information on the location of the shops. The visits to premises were made as part of Operation CC, which the Trading Standards team is an active participant in. This is a nationwide strategy between Scottish Trading Standards Services and His Majesty's Revenue and Customs, set up in 2021 to tackle the retail sale of illegal tobacco products. Illegal cigarettes and tobacco pose a significant risk to public health and safety as they are unregulated and contain higher levels of harmful chemicals than those that are legally sold. Residents are urged to look out for unusual packaging that does not contain typical health warnings and features spelling mistakes, discoloured packaging or modified logos. Community Sergeant Eddie White of Police Scotland added, Police Scotland recognises the risks posed to members of the community from the trade in illegal tobacco and will continue to work alongside East Renfrewshire Trading Standards in our efforts to keep people safe and healthy within their local community. An article written by Gillian McPherson. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Glasgow Church to close due to insufficient numbers. An exclusive article written by Esther Tarnay. A Glasgow church is set to close and its congregation will merge with another one due to insufficient numbers. Kelvin Bridge Parish Church in the West End is scheduled to form a union with Wellington Parish Church, leaving the building empty. The proposal, which is waiting for presbytery approval, comes after the number of worshippers dropped, preventing the proper maintenance of the location. Instead, a new ministry team will be established at Wellington Church, called Kelvin West. Richard Baxter, minister at Wellington, said that this was an exciting opportunity that would help them reach more people. He added, We already work across traditional church boundaries, hosting an Orthodox community and the chapel, Praying Hands Asian Fellowship and others, so we're more like a West End Christian centre than a traditional Church of Scotland church. We look forward to working even more closely with our neighbours. Penny Stewart, session clerk at Kelvin Bridge, said, As the smaller of the two congregations, we look forward to being part of a larger new church, to bringing our key groups, personnel and gifts to this fresh venture. Together and in partnership with others, we believe we'll be better resourced to engage in care and outreach to the communities around us in this part of Glasgow. A Church of Scotland spokesperson confirmed the proposal is part of the Presbytery of Glasgow's mission plan and was backed by both congregations. They added, Sadly, the number of regular worshippers at Kelvin Bridge is insufficient to allow the congregation to maintain a building of its age, size and architectural significance. By sharing the building and resources with Wellington Parish Church, the church can look forward to new ways of providing a strong and effective mission to this part of the city's West End. Pending a final approval, there is no timeline yet for the closure. An exclusive article written by Esther Tarnay. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Hundreds of Glasgow streets set to face a pavement parking ban. An article written by Sarah Hilly. Hundreds of Glasgow streets are set to face a pavement parking ban at the end of next month, but there are still many roads where it's not been decided yet. Fixed penalty notices are due to be issued by wardens come the end of September, when systems are in place to roll out the new parking rules for those streets where they're applicable. And now Glasgow City Council has launched an interactive map to help residents find out if their road has a restriction on pavement parking or whether it's currently still exempt. Those living on roads with restrictions face getting a ticket if they park on the pavement, double park or leave their car at a dropped curb. Where pavement parking restrictions are not operational yet, ongoing assessment is taking place to see if the rule will apply to them in the future. The roads subject to parking tickets are at least 7.5 metres wide to allow a fire engine to pass when cars are on both sides of the road or are in areas already controlled by parking restrictions. 
A council official told Tuesday's Environment and Liveable Neighbourhood City Policy Committee about the Parking Rules interactive map, which shows which streets are subject to parking enforcement. She said anything highlighted magenta on that map should not be considered for an exemption. Anything highlighted in green needs further assessment for us to determine the most appropriate course of action. The official told councillors that street assessments are expected to be completed by the end of the year and the interactive map will be updated. The meeting heard that the Lynn Ward is the first area of the city which has been assessed and recommendations will be put forward. A council report said enforcement of pavement parking will be introduced on a phased basis where an assessment has been completed. It added, the parking availability surveys and road assessments for all other wards will now be programmed to begin once the school holidays finish using voluntary internal resources and it's hoped that the parking availability surveys and assessment proformers will be complete by the end of 2024. Thereafter, during the last quarter of this financial year, we will review and publish the results and put forward any associated recommendations. An article written by Sarah Hilly. Glasgow Times Politics On Friday the 30th of August John Swinney hits out at Labour austerity. An article written by Stuart Patterson The SNP meets for its annual conference this weekend, the first gathering since the party lost all six Glasgow seats at the general election. The event, the party's 90th annual conference, will hear from John Swinney in his first conference speech as leader. Mr Swinney is due to open the conference tomorrow and then close it with his leader's speech on Sunday. He will use the platform to criticise the planned spending cuts by the new UK Labour government, which he said will have an impact on the quality of life in Scotland. Ahead of the three-day conference in Edinburgh, Mr Swinney said, SNP delegates gather this weekend in Edinburgh at the end of a watershed week in UK politics. The Prime Minister's speech on Tuesday had made it clear that Scotland is facing years of austerity under Labour, which will have profound consequences for public services and living standards. The SNP said the decision by the UK government to means test the winter fuel payment to only those pensioners on pension credit will cost Scotland around £160 million in funding. And on Wednesday in Glasgow, Chancellor Rachel Reeves said the problems in the UK finances will not be resolved in one budget. Mr Swinney added, I'm listening to the people of Scotland and their priorities, and I'm lucky to be supported by thousands of dedicated and determined SNP members who want to see our country move forward. I'm proud to lead a government which is delivering transformational change for people across Scotland. At the general election, the SNP lost 39 seats, going down to nine MPs. Mr Swinney will look to galvanise party members as it begins preparations for the next Scottish Parliament elections in 2026. Mr Swinney said, The SNP government is focused on ending child poverty, supporting economic growth, improving public services and tackling the climate emergency. But be in no doubt, our ability to serve the people of Scotland is under real threat by the sweeping spending cuts that the Labour government is introducing. Cuts that only a few months ago they were denying would take place. The SNP, and indeed Scotland as a whole, must come together to stand up against Labour's cuts. Mr Swinney restated the SNP belief that independence is the best route to improving public services and the economy in Scotland. He added, My belief that Scotland will be better as an independent country has never been stronger, and I know that we will win our independence when we show the people of Scotland that the powers of independence are central to improving their living standards, their local services and their communities. Under my leadership, the SNP will work harder than ever for the country that we are privileged to lead. What people in Scotland need right now is hope and ambition for a better future, and that is what the SNP will offer. The conference will debate and vote on a number of resolutions, including tax powers, austerity, housing, drug deaths and abortion rights. An article written by Stuart Patterson. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. Special stamps celebrate the 50th anniversary of the television series Porridge. 
an article written by Hannah Roberts from PA Media. Eight special stamps of TV comedy series Porridge will be issued to celebrate the show's 50th anniversary, the Royal Mail has announced. They feature memorable quotes and scenes from the sitcom and the faces of the well-known cast, including Richard Beckinsale as Lenny Godber, Ronnie Barker as Norman Stanley Fletcher and Fulton Mackay as Mr Mackay. The British TV show follows jailbirds Norman and Lenny as they come face to face with the reality of imprisonment, while surrounded by petty criminals and prison officers, including Mr Mackay and Mr Barraclough, played by Brian Wilde. The show, which was written by Dick Clement and Ian Lefranet, ran for three series between 1974 and 1977, and also had a big screen adaptation and the sequel series going straight. Speaking about the series, Mr Clement said, Ian and I told Ronnie that we'd come up with a perfect title for the series. He said he had two. We let him go first. Porridge, he said. We stared at each other and laughed. That was our title too. Mr Lafrenet added, So it was agreed with Ronnie and ourselves that we would write a comedy set in prison. In the interests of research, Dick and I visited Wormwood Scrubs, Wandsworth and Brixton, after which we decided that there was absolutely no way a series about porridge could ever be funny. David Gold, Director of External Affairs and Policy at Royal Mail, said, Porridge continues to resonate with audiences even after five decades, thanks to the quality of the writing and the characters the cast brought to the screen. These stamps celebrate British television creativity that is timeless and enduring. Ronnie Barker, who died at the age of 76 in 2005, was known for being one half of The Two Ronnies. He also played Albert Arkwright in television series Open All Hours and appeared in the satirical television show The Frost Report. Richard Beckinsale, father to actress Kate Beckinsale, played Alan Moore in the sitcom The Rising Damp and died in 1979 at the age of 31. The stamps and a range of collectible products are available to pre-order from August the 29th on the Royal Mail website and they go on general sale on September the 3rd. A presentation pack including all eight stamps is priced at £14.30. An article written by Hannah Roberts. Glasgow Times News on Friday the 30th of August. STV star who lived with cancer for 15 years hosts a new podcast. An article written by Sandia Suresh. The University of Glasgow's involvement in cancer research is set to feature in a charity's new podcast. Beats and Cancer Charity has launched its podcast series, Beats and Talks, hosted by STV's Laura Boyd. It aims to inform and support cancer patients and their families. Among the episodes lined up features a discussion between Laura and Professor Anthony Chalmers, Chair of Clinical Oncology at the University of Glasgow, and the Beetson West of Scotland Cancer Centre. They explore the advanced research at the Beetson, the significance of clinical trials in cancer treatments, and possibilities for the future of cancer treatment. Laura said, It's been an absolute pleasure hosting the Beetson Talks podcast. Getting to hear the stories of patients, doctors and those affected by cancer really has been both an emotional and inspirational experience, and one which will stay with me forever. Having lived with cancer for 15 years myself, I know how much learning about others' stories of how they've coped and the tools they've used can help, and being able to share both this and the fantastic range of services that the Beats and Cancer charity offers in what can be the most incredibly difficult time in someone's life has been really special. The second episode features Patrick Baines, who recounts the loss of his mother and sister to cancer. He's joined by the charity's bereavement service psychologist, Gemma Byrne. The series also includes insights from former Chief Executive Officer Martin Corley, reflections from Gillian Shiriffs, a breast cancer patient living with multiple sclerosis, and a discussion on the psychological challenges of living with cancer. Gillian Hailstones, Chief Executive of the Beats and Cancer Charity, said... We are incredibly proud to launch Beats and Talks, a platform that not only highlights the exceptional work of our charity, but also gives a voice to those directly affected by cancer. 
The first three episodes of Beats and Talks are now available on streaming platforms, with the final two episodes set to be released weekly. An article written by Santia Suresh. Glasgow Times News. On Friday the 30th of August. Under-22s clock up over 150 million free bus journeys in Scotland. An article written by Craig Williams. Ministers have hailed a significant milestone moment, as figures show more than 150 million bus journeys have been completed since the introduction of free travel for under-22s in Scotland. The Young Persons Free Bus Travel Scheme began on the 31st of January 2022 and gives all those aged 5 to 21 years old the ability to travel on public transport free of charge. The scheme aims to encourage more sustainable travel and tackle issues related to transport poverty by encouraging more young people to start travelling by bus at an early age and opening up social, education, employment and leisure opportunities. Commenting on the figures, Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Transport, said, I'm delighted that young people all over Scotland have now made over 150 million journeys using their free bus pass. The scheme is making a huge difference for children, young people and their families, with this transformational policy making sustainable travel easier and cheaper for them each and every day. It's not just about the number of journeys, it's about what these journeys mean. It's opening doors to new opportunities, keeping people connected and making sustainable transport more affordable, giving Scotland's children and young people the very best chance to succeed in life. I want to thank every young person who's using Scotland's buses responsibly and in doing so playing their part in cutting emissions and tackling climate change. An article written by Craig Williams. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 2nd of September. Calls for the owner of a fire-ravaged site to erect a roof fast. An article written by Sarah Hilly. A senior Glasgow councillor has demanded that the owner of a fire-ravaged building erect a roof on it as soon as possible. SNP councillor Rory Kelly met with the owner and the architect of the former Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice at Carlton Place. A blaze engulfed the B-listed property in the Gorbals area earlier this month, which police believe may have been started deliberately. There are now fears about the property deteriorating further. Commenting on his meeting over the future of the historic building, Councillor Kelly said, We've been out at Carlton Place talking to the owners and the architect of this building following the most recent fire. We stressed the importance of getting a temporary roof on as soon as possible to protect the fabric of the building and asked them for a work plan for what they're going to do for the renovation and, most importantly, the early work of getting protections in place. We did stress that very strongly. The City Convener for Neighbourhood and Services and Assets said if action doesn't take place, the Council will step in. He said, if they weren't going to do it very soon, we would have to look at other measures, with the council stepping in and then looking to recoup our costs. It's imperative that we protect this building and don't allow it to go the same way as so many other buildings in private ownership have in Glasgow. We had previously reported in April how there were claims that drug users had moved into the privately owned vacant property, which lies off Bridge Street. The most recent fire was not the first, as a smaller blaze took place at the Georgian Terrace in January. Councillor Kelly added, The finances available to the Council for interventions can be prohibitive, but I'm determined to take a more forceful approach to protecting the built heritage of this city and stepping in at an early stage. He continued, We will then aggressively chase owners to recoup the cost to the people of Glasgow. Property owners, the City Council included, are all merely custodians of this city for future generations and have a responsibility to both protect and improve its fabric. An article written by Sarah Hilly. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 2nd of September. Former bodybuilder back behind bars for involvement in organised crime. This article was filed by a court reporter. A former Mr Scotland bodybuilder is back behind bars for his role in a lucrative drug trafficking operation. 
John Barry Macduff was snared after the law authorities smashed the EncroChat phone network favoured by criminals. Scores of hacked messages uncovered what the 40-year-old and his associates were up to. One fellow dealer boasted to Mr Macduff how they had the biggest network in Glasgow. Mr Macduff, who latterly worked at a sports nutrition store in the city's West End, now faces a lengthy jail sentence after he admitted to a charge of being involved in serious organised crime. He was previously crowned Mr Scotland in 2012, after winning the 90kg category at the National Amateur Bodybuilding Championships. But Mr Macduff, once described as a hero figure, was jailed for three years in 2015 for drug charges. He'll be sentenced for this latest offence in late September. The charges relate to activities between March and June 2020. Mr Macduff used handles such as Biggie GLA on EncroChat. Prosecutor Adrian Stalker told the High Court in Glasgow, The totality of the conversations confirm that Mr Macduff, acting with others, was involved in serious organised crime. He initially had chats with an associate using the nickname Glasgow Celtic, discussing consignments of cocaine and heroin. The individual known as Glasgow Celtic sent a photo of two blocks of drugs with a blue crocodile sticker on each. There was a further discussion with another criminal about Mr Macduff expecting a delivery of 60 kilograms of cannabis. An associate then inquired about the steroid oxandrolone. In relation to the collection of the drug at the shop, Mr Macduff stated, Yes, mate, open Saturday, 12 till 2. One fellow dealer was then chasing Mr Macduff for around £100,000, apparently owed. Mr Macduff was later back in touch with the user Glasgow Celtic. This individual said he could supply him with 6 kilograms of cocaine and 10 kilograms of heroin. Mr Stalker said they then negotiated over the price, agreeing £45,000 per kilo for cocaine and £18,000 each for heroin. In early April, Mr Macduff had encrypted chats with an individual known as Burrito Castle. This person stated to Mr Macduff, We are different from the rest. We will make it, bro. We have the biggest network combined in Glasgow, 100%. Mr Macduff said, Defo, brother, we will do just fine. The pair also spoke about having enough cash to be sitting with 100 flats. The duo later discussed the trafficking of cannabis. Mr Stalker revealed that there were further chats with the user Glasgow Celtic about large hauls of cocaine. Mr Macduff also discussed the supply of 1 million diazepam tablets valued at £600,000. The court heard of more chats with the user Glasgow Celtic about Mr Macduff owing £604,000. Lord Arthurson deferred sentencing until late September in Edinburgh and Mr Macduff was remanded in custody. That article was filed by a court reporter. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 2nd of September. HMS Cardiff leaves Glasgow to enter the water for the first time. An article written by Ava White HMS Cardiff has set off from Glasgow as she prepares to enter the water for the first time. The ship is the second of eight Type 26 frigates being built at BAE Systems for the Royal Navy. She was recently transferred by a team of engineering specialists from the shipyard slipway to begin the float-off process. The barge has now departed from Glasgow and will be towed down the River Clyde to a deep-water location in the west of Scotland. Once in position and over a number of hours, the barge will submerge and the anti-submarine warfare frigate will enter the water. HMS Cardiff, which has Welsh singer Catherine Jenkins as her official sponsor, will then return to BAE Systems' Scotston shipyard, where she'll undergo the next stages of outfitting before testing and commissioning. David Shepherd, Type 26 Programme Director at BAE Systems, said Seeing the latest ship in the water for the first time will be a proud and exciting moment for the thousands of people involved in this great national endeavour. The Type 26 has awesome and world-leading capability and we're looking forward to installing HMS Cardiff's complex systems and bringing her to life. 
The float-off process is a modern, efficient and low-risk way for ships to enter the water, compared to the previous dynamic launches where ships were slid down a slipway and into the water. The process was used for the first of class HMS Glasgow in November 2022, as well as for five offshore patrol vessels, which BAE Systems also built in Glasgow. Pat Browning, Type 26 team leader at Defence Equipment and Support, said, We're delighted to have reached this key milestone in the build programme for HMS Cardiff. This is a significant development for the entire Type 26 programme team and is a moment we can all be proud of as we continue to work towards delivering the new fleet of the Royal Navy's most cutting-edge anti-submarine warfare frigates. Three Type 26 vessels are currently under construction in Glasgow. HMS Glasgow is undergoing the outfit of its combat and mission systems at Scotston, whilst HMS Belfast and HMS Birmingham are under construction in Govan. The process of building each ship involves its structure being completed in Govan, where skilled teams of fabricators and steelworkers construct the units before they're assembled into two main blocks. These are then joined together externally on the hard standing before the ship departs. HMS Cardiff will be the last Type 26 to have this initial work partly constructed outside, as the new multi-million pound shipbuild hall in Govan will allow teams to complete the structures of the remaining frigates indoors. In Scotston, the ship's outfitting is completed and the complex systems are installed before test and commissioning takes place. HMS Glasgow, as the first ship in its class, is expected to enter service in 2028. An article written by Ava White. Glasgow Times News on Monday, the 2nd of September. More than 150,000 object to Flamingoland plans. An article written by Ava White. More than 150,000 people have objected to Flamingoland's plans to develop on the banks of Loch Lomond, according to the Scottish Greens. It comes after a petition was launched by the party in opposition to the £40 million mega-resort proposals. The Yorkshire-based theme park operator proposes creating more than 100 holiday lodges, two hotels, a water park, a monorail, 372 car parking spaces, shops and more on the site. Ross Greer, MSP for West Scotland, claims the proposal is the most unpopular planning application in Scottish history. He said, the message from the local community and from across Scotland is loud and clear. Flamingoland is not welcome at Loch Lomond. 150,000 is a monumental number of objections for a planning application, which tells you all you need to know about just how destructive and unwelcome these mega-resort plans are. It would be a disaster for Balach and for Loch Lomond, It would destroy the gateway to one of Scotland's most iconic landscapes and have a devastating impact on local wildlife and nature, never mind the threat to local businesses and grief for residents. This saga has lasted for almost a decade and the community is simply exhausted. They want Flamingoland gone for good. We previously reported that the plans had received opposition from the National Trust of Scotland, the Woodland Trust, Rambler Scotland and the local community council. According to the Scottish Greens, the previous record for objections to a planning application was held by Flamingoland's first planning application for the site in Balach. It was opposed by just under 60,000 people. Ross Greer added, I'm grateful to everyone who's taken the time to lodge their objection and make the scale of opposition known. The more people learn about Flamingoland's daft plans, the more determined they are to stop them. Early on in this process, they promised to walk away if they didn't win public support. We passed that point long ago. If they have any shame, Flamingoland will drop this appalling application and leave Loch Lomond alone. The latest planning application will be decided on at a meeting of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park Board on September the 16th. An article written by Eva White. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 2nd of September. Plans to axe hundreds of teachers in Glasgow branded a suicide mission. An article written by Stuart Patterson. 
plans to axe. Hundreds of teachers in Glasgow have been branded a suicide mission by a union leader. Glasgow could be facing a school strike this autumn over council plans to cut teachers by up to 10%. The EIS union is balloting members over the proposed cuts and union leaders said there is already strong feeling in favour of a strike if necessary. Andrea Bradley, the EIS's general secretary, said the teacher cuts, if allowed to proceed, would impact every aspect of education. She said the council is planning to cut 450 teachers, including 172 this year and on top of 125 lost last year. She said Glasgow City Council has a plan to hemorrhage 10% of teachers. If it's not stopped, it will have implications for those with additional support needs on behaviour and critically, in a city like Glasgow, it will seriously harm the city's ability to reduce the poverty-related attainment gap. In that respect, she said it was a suicide mission. Miss Bradley said it would increase workload for the remaining teachers who were already overburdened. The union leader said it would be an absolute calamity. She questioned how Glasgow got itself into this situation. Last week, the Glasgow Times reported that Douglas Hutchison, Director of Education at Glasgow City Council, stated he did not recognise the figure of 10% when put to him at a council committee meeting. He was asked by Fiona Higgins, Labour councillor, about the impact the loss of 10% of teachers would have on equality work. Mr Hutchison replied, We are not losing 10% of the teachers in the city. That would be the first point to make. Miss Bradley said 450 teachers overall, on top of 125 lost last year, was the figure the EIS was balloting on. She added, That is the rationale for the ballot. If Glasgow City Council wants to adjust that figure, they're welcome to do that. Andrew Bradley was speaking at an EIS event at the SNP conference in Edinburgh on education in Scotland, together with Jenny Gilruth, Education Secretary. Jenny Gilruth said she was not going to comment on the local situation in Glasgow. However, she added, I can't improve attainment with fewer teachers in Scotland. It's for the birds. I'm watching very closely. The EIS ballot of all teacher members in Glasgow opens on Monday morning and lasts until October the 2nd. Glasgow City Council declined the offer to comment. An article written by Stuart Patterson. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 2nd of September. Cash Strap Council spent more than £8 million on private hire taxis. An article written by Amanda Keenan. Cash-strapped council chiefs have come under fire after they spent over £8 million on taxis in just one year. The local authority says the majority of the costs are associated with private hire cabs being used to transport children with additional support needs to schools that best meet their individual requirements. But campaigners say the spend is excessive and believe that more cost-effective ways to meet travel demands must be found. Figures obtained by a Freedom of Information request revealed that Glasgow City Council forked out a staggering £8,396,610 on fares between 2023 and 2024, with around £7.3 million of this allocated to school runs. It comes as the local authority faces a huge budget deficit, with a projected shortfall of £120 million for the fiscal year. Taxpayers and councillors have criticised the bill, insisting more solutions could have been found, leaving cash to protect or to boost flagging council services. One source told the Glasgow Times this is an eye-watering amount to spend on transport, especially as the council is already trimming so many other vital community services. Surely it would make more sense to hire drivers and invest in specialist multi-purpose vehicles to help alleviate the pressure. Any council funding needs to be deployed with great care and thought, but this just seems like a lot of taxpayers' money, and the school's aspect still leaves £1 million unaccounted for. This is a concern, especially given the state of the city centre and other problems the council is facing. We need to find funds to sort out the general mess of the city centre, boost education and invest in community services instead of lining the pockets of private companies. 
I think that most taxpayers will be dismayed at these findings. It's an exceptional spend over the course of 12 months. All we hear is how the council needs to make more cuts. So where has the money come from for this? Labour councillor Robert Mooney urged council bosses to have an urgent rethink before deciding where cash should be earmarked in future. He added, it's a massive amount to spend on taxis in just one year. It's important that we meet the needs of these children, but there must be a better way to do it or we need to find one. There are urgent priorities that are clear to see all over the city. The revelation that the council is spending over £8 million annually raises serious questions about whether this expenditure represents value for our residents. In addition, this raises serious concerns about the priorities and decision-making of this city administration. In these times of financial constraints, it's essential that such expenditures are scrutinised to ensure that they provide value for money. They must explain how this outlay aligns with our financial responsibility and effective use of public funds. There needs to be more discussion, debate and ultimately transparency overall into how public money is being used. A Glasgow City Council spokeswoman said distances that some pupils are having to travel are leading to higher transport costs. She added, the vast majority of these costs relates to the statutory provision of home-to-school transport of pupils and young people with additional support needs. Individual needs of children and young people in the city are matched to a school that will meet those needs and as such may not be close to the child's home. In 2023-2024, education spent £7.3 million on transport and for an average of 1,400 pupils per day. An article written by Amanda Keenan. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, from the news section, Armed cops race to Paisley Street amid incident. Article written by Ben Waddell. Armed cops race to a residential street in Paisley amid an incident involving weapons. Police say they were called to an alleged disturbance on Stevenson Street in the, t- in the town on Monday, September the 2nd. Cops were alerted to the incident at around 7.45pm. 999 crews rushed to the scene. After that, two men aged 33 and 35 were taken to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. On top of that, a 48-year-old man was taken to the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. The trio are currently being treated in hospital for their injuries. Meanwhile, the force says three men, aged 33, 35 and 48, have been arrested in connection with the alleged incident. It is understood the incident allegedly involved bladed weapons while armed response officers attended. An investigation is underway. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, Around 7.45pm on Monday, September 2nd, 2024, police received a report of a disturbance in Stevenson Street, Paisley. Officers attended and two men, aged 33 and 35 years, were taken by ambulance to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow and a 48-year-old man was taken by ambulance to the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. The three men are currently being treated in hospital for their injuries. Three men, aged 33, 35 and 48 years, have been arrested in connection with the incident and inquiries are ongoing. A spokesperson for the Scottish Ambulance Service said, We received a call at 7.51pm on Monday, September 2nd to attend an incident on Cullside, Paisley. We dispatched two ambulances and three special operations response teams. SORT, to the scene. One patient was transported to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. And that report was by Ben Model. From the Glasgow Times, Saturday the 24th of August, from the news section, asthma deaths in Scotland reach highest level since 1992. Asthma deaths in Scotland have reached the highest level in 32 years, statistics show. Figures from the National Records of Scotland reveal 140 people died from asthma attacks in 2023, which is the largest number since 1992. Charity Asthma Plus Lung UK Scotland 
has called for urgent action after carrying out a survey which found 76% of people are not receiving basic asthma care, including reviews, inhaler technique checks and written asthma action plans. Key risk factors for death from asthma are include overuse of reliever inhalers, indicating poorly controlled asthma, underuse of preventer inhalers and recent immersion to hospital visits receiving no follow-up. Additionally, the survey found less than 40% of respondents who had been treated in the hospital for asthma were getting the care they needed within 48 hours, when they were most at risk, once they had been discharged. The charity is calling on the Scottish Government to make lung conditions a priority and ensure everyone with asthma has access to a basic level of care. The figures come shortly after the 10-year anniversary of a key report by the Royal College of Physicians, published in 2014, which found two-thirds of asthma deaths were preventable. A spokesperson for the charity said, Figures show that since the release of the landmark publication, the number of asthma deaths in Scotland has increased by 94% and increasingly, stretched healthcare professionals don't have the resources to provide people with the support they need. Joseph Carter, Head of Asthma Plus Lung UK Scotland, said, It is deeply worrying that asthma deaths in Scotland are at the highest rate since the early 1990s. One person dying from asthma is one person too many. People are simply not getting the care they need and deserve. As a result, Scotland continues to have one of the worst asthma death rates in Europe. Public Health Minister Jenny Minto said, My deepest sympathies go out to anyone who has suffered a bereavement due to asthma. We are ensuring everyone living with respiratory conditions receives the best possible care, treatment and support to enable them to live longer, healthier lives. And that article was unattributed, but it was read by me, Ian McKenna. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, from the news section, City's £1 million drive to help tackle health inequality. Report by Anne Fotheringham. A pilot programme aimed at tackling health inequality is to receive a £1 million boost from Glasgow City Council. Live Well Community Referral Service, which helps people get more active and combat loneliness, has been so successful it has secured funding to expand citywide over the next three years, with the aim of supporting up to 2,500 people annually. The scheme, which was trialled in Colton, will now focus on 10 priority areas with the highest levels of health inequality, including Deniston, Durham Chapel and Allensland. In addition, the team will work with some GP practices in Easterhouse. Following the first rollout, Live Well will then continue to expand to ensure people who live in all parts of the city can access the programme by summer 2026. Live Well advisors help people create a plan focused on achieving personal goals, assisting them in finding local activities they are interested in, from walking groups, museum visits and sports sessions to family activities, volunteering opportunities and arts workshops. Advisors will also attend with participants if they feel the first visit could be daunting. People can self-refer, with other referrals into the programme coming from a range of partner agencies, including Police Scotland. Live Well will also work closely with voluntary organisations in each community to encourage more referrals. Last year, an independent evaluation of the pilot programme found 100% of participants felt their general happiness had improved, while Almost every participant agreed that that taking part in activities had helped them to feel less lonely and be more physically active. A total of 96% agreed that they would not have taken part without Live Well support. Andrew Olney, Director of Libraries, Sport and Communities at Glasgow Life said, Everyone involved in Live Well is delighted that it will be extended across Glasgow and that anyone in any part of the city will be able to access the programme and the many benefits it offers. Our advisors are based in local communities. We know that changing outcomes for communities is only ever possible when you work with the citizens of that community, placing them at the very heart of leading that change. He added, People are the experts in what their daily challenges are and, by shifting the relationship to allowing an individual to take charge of their life and what they want to do, 
we have seen real success. The Live Well team is hugely excited to be expanding across the entire city. And that report was by Anne Fotheringham. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, News Crews race to high-rise alert. Emergency crews race to an incident at a high-rise flatting block in Glasgow. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service say they were ca- called to a fire affecting the 8th floor of a multi-storey building on Echo Street in the city's north on Sunday. Emergency crews were alerted to the blaze at around 2.30pm. In total, four fire trucks were sent to the scene. After that, firefighters tackled the blaze in the building. Luckily, no one was injured during the incident. A spokesperson for the SFRS said, We were alerted at 2.34pm on Sunday, September the 1st, to reports of a fire affecting the 8th floor of a multi-storey building on Echo Street, Glasgow. Operations Control mobilised four appliances to the scene and extinguished the blaze. There were no reported casualties and fire crews ensured the area was made safe before leaving the scene. That article was unattributed. From the Glasgow Times Tuesday the 3rd of September From the news section East End Nursery first in Glasgow to achieve top award Report by Anne Fotheringham A Glasgow nursery has become the first in the city to achieve a prestigious award. Mullendina Family Learning Centre in the East End received the Unifest Rights Respecting School Bronze Award for its work helping children understand their rights. Sharon McLaren, head of the centre, said At Mullendina, we feel supporting the children to develop an understanding of their rights is a very important part of their development. Our children are beginning to understand their rights and how important they are, enabling them to build resilience and be confident as they transition through each stage of the nursery, then onto their next adventures in primary school. We are so proud of this award and are already striving to achieve silver in the near future. Councillor Christina Cannon, the city's education and early years convener, said, this is an amazing achievement for all of the Morondina Family Learning Centre community. I am so proud of all of the pupils and staff for attaining their award and being the first early year centre in the city to do so. The commitment to teaching our children about their rights and from such a young age is so important. Sharon Curran, whose daughter attends the centre, said, It feels wonderful to know my child is growing and learning in such a positive and nurturing environment where her voice can be heard at such a young age. Learning about children's rights will have such a positive impact on all the wee ones, not only in nursery but throughout the rest of their lives, and I'm absolutely delighted to know my wee girl is part of it all. And that report was by Anne Fotheringham. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, in the news section. Father's death spurs push for tougher bike controls. Exclusive by Stuart Patterson A son whose father was killed after he was hit by an off-road bike in Glasgow has backed calls for tougher action on the use of unlicensed bikes. David Gow, 79, died on February the 12th last year following the incident on Balmore Road in the north of Glasgow. The use of off-road bikes has been debated in the Scottish Parliament this week. Craig Gow, 47, from Parkhouse, said he supported efforts to introduce strict controls on the sale and use of off-road bikes before someone else suffers the pain and hurt he and his family have endured. Mr Gow said, Is it going to take more people being killed before action is taken? The day my dad died, it was a dark night. If it wasn't my dad, it would have been someone else. He was my dad. Someone else will be killed and their family will go through the pain and hurt and going through The people on these bikes, whether it's off-road or power-assisted e-bikes or scooters, don't seem to have any idea of safety. There must be governance before someone else died. It is the elderly and the very young who are most at risk and who will suffer. He said it is a widespread problem and poses a challenge to police. Mr Gow added, something must be done. 
these bikes are up and down the road all the time. It's not just in our area. From speaking to other people, it's everywhere. It is mostly off-road bikes, but also electric and power-assisted bikes. They are too easy to buy. There's no governance. It is as easy to get a hold of one of these bikes as it is to buy a pedal bike if you have the money. There's no insurance or license needed. And it's nigh on impossible to police. Bo de Doris, Mary Hill and Springborn SMPM MSP, has secured a members debate in Holyrood this week on the misuse of off-road vehicles, calling for the Scottish Government, local authorities and Police Scotland to be involved in a UK Department of Transport task force to tackle, to tackle the nuisance and dangers of such vehicles. Doris said, The irresponsible use of off-road vehicles are an increasing problem across our communities. At best it can be a nuisance to communities, at their tragic worst it can cause serious injury and take life. Sadly, that has certainly been the case in Mary Hill and Springburn. I am grateful for the Gow family for sharing their story regarding the tragic killing of David Gow and for their support ahead of Wednesday's parliamentary debate. I hope the debate helps build a partnership approach between all levels of government and to take action to help tackle this growing danger including carefully considering the requirement to register such vehicles. Many who use off-road vehicles do so sensibly and responsibly. However, far too many do not take, do not, and place themselves and others at great risk. Two men, aged 23 and 24, have since been arrested and charged in connection with the incident that led to Mr Gow's death. And that article was an exclusive by Stuart Patterson. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, from the news section, Pensioner, 90, in charity zipline bid. A 19-year-old pensioner is planning a zipline to help homeless people in Glasgow. Gladys Speedy said she has never seen the homeless crisis so bad in the city despite living a long life. Now she has convinced her friends to sponsor her as she takes on a 100-foot zipline over the Clyde on Friday. She will give all funds to Glasgow City Mission a Christian charitable organisation that focuses on helping vulnerable people. Gladys turned 19 in April this year and she wanted to mark the event by helping others. Gladys said, Having lived a long life, I don't recall the issue of homelessness like I see it now. I can only hope I can raise awareness of the need to give help now. Every little would help, but more would be better. She continued, If people suffer from depression or addiction, they need help. People who don't know how to look after themselves need to be given better support than is available now. Glasgow City Mission's marketing and fundraising manager, Jack Geddes, said, We have incredible supporters of all ages and stages. Gladys contacted us last year to arrange to join us for this event and we are looking forward to watching her zip slide along the Glasgow skyline this Friday. Gladys is an inspiration to us all. Gladys is collecting money using her traditional sponsor sheets. However, if you would like to support Gladys' efforts, you can donate online at our fundraising page. For more information about Glasgow City Mission's work with those affected by homelessness, poverty and addiction, please contact Jack Geddes, Marketing and Fundraising Manager, Glasgow City Mission. Email jack at glasgowcitymission.com and that article was unattributed. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, in the news section, Prisoner has died in custody at HMP Low Moss in Bishop Briggs. Report by Ben Waddle. A prisoner has died in custody at HMP Low Moss in Bishop Briggs. The Scottish Prison Service, SPS, announced that Mark Cox passed away on Saturday, aged 31. Our sister title, the Greenock Telegraph, reported that the 47-year-old was caged for three years at Greenock Sheriff Court on August 19, 2024. He was found guilty by a jury of three indictment charges, including attacks on a female complainer and on a young child. Now, SPS says a fatal accident inquiry will be held into the Greenock man's death. 
Meanwhile, police Scotland have been advised of Coxie's death and the manner the matter will be reported to the procurator fiscal. A spokesperson for the SPS said, Every death, whether in prison custody or, or in our communities, is a tragedy for all those who knew and supported the individual. Following the death of someone in our care, Police Scotland is advised and the matter is reported to the Procurator Fiscal. Fatal accident inquiries are held in due course. And that report was written by Ben Waddle and read by me, Ian McKenna. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, in the news section, Road safety projects get £1 million boost to save lives. More than £1 million is set to be invested in projects aimed at improving safety on Glasgow's roads, including traffic signal upgrades. Money from Transport Scotland's Road Safety Improvement Fund, RSIF, is expected to be shared between a priority list of projects set out by roads officials. They have been picked out following analysis of injury accidents, recorded vehicle speeds and heavily used crossings. The Council's City Administration Committee will be asked to approve acceptance of the funding at a meeting on Thursday. There are plans to spend £230,000 to upgrade traffic signals at the junction of Balmore Road and Ashgill Road. Tactile cones and paving will be installed. At eight locations, £58,000 is set to be spent to upgrade crossings, including installing tactile cones with the aim of imp- imp- improvising active travel journeys and road safety. The work will be carried out at Ashgy Road, Shawbridge Street, Pollock Shores Road, Maxwell Road, Eglinton Toll, Gallagate, Sword Street, The Burton Road, Hawke Street, Pollock Shores Road, Titwood Road, Paisley Road West, Lourdes Avenue, Dalmarnock Road, Summerfield Street, Old Chesterton Road, McNair Street. In a report, officials said the Scottish Government has committed to a safe system approach to road safety, which is based on the principle that our life and health should not be compromised by our need to travel. They added that RSIF aims to help councils meet road casualty reduction targets. Other planned projects include traffic calming measures, such as pedestrian islands and speed cushions at Shields Road, Arrowcar Street and Rothes Drive. A footway extension and pedestrian island is planned on Langside Avenue at Camp Hill Avenue slash Maisonhoud Road, while speed cushions are set to be installed at Loch End Road. And that article was unattributed. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 3rd of September, in the news section, Serial Teen Rapist Jailed Report by Kirsty Fierick A serial teen rapist has been jailed after carrying out a string of disturbing attacks on girls. Sam Brown was found guilty of seven charges following a trial at the High Court in Edinburgh. While a teenager, he attacked four girls over the course of nine months and has now been given a ten-year extended sentence. Brown, now 20, met his first victim on social media before violently and sexually assaulting her on March 10, 2022, during their first in-person meet-up. The following day, he attacked and raped a 16-year-old at an address in Edinburgh. Brown met his second victim on social media before entering into a short relationship with her in June 2022. He raped a 16-year-old at an address in Glasgow before sexually assaulting her in a wooded area. The same victim was also repeatedly struck in the head during consensual intercourse with Brown. Later that same month, on June 28th, Brown sexually assaulted his third victim, a 14-year-old girl, after meeting up with her at the Edinburgh City Centre. On December 17th, Brown sexually assaulted a 15-year-old girl in a field in the capital after meeting her on Snapchat. Yesterday at the High Court in Edinburgh, he was ordered to serve seven years in custody with a further three-year extension. Non-harassment orders banning Brown from contacting or attempting to contact all four victims were granted indefinitely. Scottish Procurator Fiscal for High Court Sexual Offending, Katrina Parks, said, 
Sam Brown is a dangerous individual who poses a danger to girls and young women. Despite his depraved actions inflicting unimaginable trauma, the victim showed incredible bravery giving evidence, which has ensured he will now be convicted and held accountable. We would urge any victim of a similar crime not to suffer in silence but to report it. You will be listened to and supported as we seek to secure justice using all the tools available to us. And that report was by Kirsty Feerick. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 4th of September 2024 from the news section and the headline reads Caring Dad tragically died after an incident in Cumbernauld. This article is by Ben Waddle. A caring dad has tragically died after a crash on a busy road in Cumbernauld. Jonathan Bruce passed away in hospital on Sunday, September 1st, 2024, following a single vehicle collision on the A011 Glasgow Road in the town. The incident took place at around 9pm on Saturday, August 17th. In a statement following the news, the 34-year-old's family paid tribute to the much-loved man. They said, Johnny was a loving, caring husband and a doting dad to his three children. He was loved by so many and a great friend to everyone who knew him. We asked for privacy. It was a very difficult time for us as we tried to come to terms with our loss. An investigation into the serious crash remains underway while officers are urging anyone with information to get in touch. Road Policing Sergeant Ross Allison said, Our thoughts are with Jonathan's family and friends at this difficult time and we'll continue to keep them updated as our investigations progress. I'd like to thank everyone who has come forward with information so far. Anyone who has information or dash cam footage of the area around the time and hasn't spoken to the police yet, please get in touch. A spokesperson for Police Scotland added, Anyone with information should contact the police on 101 quoting incident number 3699 of Saturday, August 17th. This article was by Ben Model. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 4th of September 2024 from the news section and the headline reads Demolition begins on iconic O2 ABC building in Glasgow. This article is by Gabriel Mackay. Demolition work has begun on the ABC building on Glasgow's Sucky Hall Street. As reported by our sister title, The Herald, campaigners looking to save the former cinema and music venue's iconic art deco facade feared the structure could be torn down as soon as this week. The building was badly damaged in the second of two fires at the Glasgow School of Art in June 2018. And last month, a dangerous building's notice was issued to its owners, requiring them to have it demolished by December 9th. Work has now begun to demolish the building and surrounding structures, with an excavator on site at the ABC. The process is expected to take several days. It's understood that there will not have to be any closure of Sucky Hall Street while the demolition takes place, with the demolition to see the building collapsed towards the north toward Renfrew Street. Council planners have ruled full or partial retention of this building is not viable, despite calls to save the Art Deco facade on the former cinema. Originally submitted in 2019, the application to knock down the building from owners Obark's No. 1 LLP received more than 50 objections. However, a report stated that visits to the site in March and June of this year showed further deterioration with the order that demolition work begin by September 30th. Writing in the Herald on Tuesday, campaign group Save Britain's Heritage urged its owners to reconsider. A letter said, We call on the current owners of the ABC Cinema, Obark's ABC Limited, and future developer Vita Group to save the eye-catching portico entrance of this Glasgow landmark and retain it as part of future proposals for this site. This former cinema, which sits right next door to the world-famous Glasgow School of Art, is under imminent threat of demolition. This Category C listed building, of cultural significance, 
is defined by its iconic Art Deco entrance, designed in 1929 by one of Scotland's celebrated cinema architects, C.J. McNeil. This building has been the site of entertainment of many different kinds for generations of Glaswegians. It has changed and adapted over the years, from panorama to circus to ice rink to dance hall to cinema to music venue. It was the site of Glasgow's first ever moving picture show. We urge the current owners and future developers to respect, not bulldoze, Glasgow's architectural heritage. Work with a conservation engineer to save not just fragments, but the whole solid central entrance to this much-loved building. Future generations will thank you. In July, plans were submitted to create student accommodation and a downstairs food hall on the site. Urban Regeneration Specialist Vita Group said, With extensive fire damage to ABC, retaining the building or its facade is not considered to be feasible due to the design, material condition and strength validation challenges uncovered through a series of surveys and structural reports. Opened in 1929 as the ABC Cinema, the building was designed by architect C.J. McNair and stood on the site of what had been Scotland's largest diorama. Before it was used as a cinema, it was the location of Hengler Circus, an ice skating rink and dance hall. Following its closure as a cinema in 1998 and 1999, it was refitted to become a music venue, with David McBride of Regular Music winning permission to create a venue holding 1,300 people. It reopened in the summer of 2005, with an event headlined by Roddy Frame. Reviewing, the Herald said, The ABC itself is a superb addition to the facilities in Style City. The main auditorium is blessed with great sound and sight lines, the bars and toilet provision generous. It's big enough to feel important and small enough to feel intimate. ABC 2 downstairs, where the Buff Club DJ spun funk and soul discs into the small hours, is likely, like the upstairs polar bar, to become a place to be seen. That summer, it would host Mogwai, US pop punk star Sum 41, and in October, an on their eyes Arctic Monkeys. Other artists to grace the stage included Paramore, Glass Vegas, Paolo Nutini, Kendrick Lamar, and Public Enemy. This article was by Gabriel Mackay. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 4th of September 2024 from the news section and the headline reads Four boys charged following building fire in Glasgow. This article is by Ben Waddle. Four teenage boys have been charged following a building blaze in Glasgow last month. Police say they were called to a building fire on Carlton Place in the city's Gorbals area on Monday, August 5th. The force was alerted to the incident at around 8.20pm. Now, officers have revealed four youngsters, two aged 15 and two aged 16, have been charged in connection. A report will be sent to the children's reporter. During the inferno, seven fire trucks were sent to battle the blaze. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service previously said they were called to a well-developed fire in a three-storey building, which was not in use. Luckily, no one was injured during the incident. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, Around 8.20pm on Monday, August 5th, 2024, we were called to a building fire on Carlton Place in Glasgow. Four male youths, two aged 15 and two aged 16, have been charged in connection and a report will be sent to the children's report. This article was by Ben Waddle. This is from the Glasgow Times, on the 4th of September 2024, from the news section, and the headline reads, Urgent warning issued ahead of big event in Glasgow. This article is by Ben Waddle. An urgent warning has been issued ahead of a big event in Glasgow. ScotRail has issued travel advice for footy fans heading to Hampden Park in the south side for Scotland's national team's first match in the UEFA Nations League. The game, which will see Scotland take on Poland, is set to take place at the stadium in the city at 7.45pm on Thursday, September 5th. Ahead of the event, 
football fans have been warned to expect longer queuing times and to allow extra time when catching train services. Meanwhile, Scott Rail says, to help supporters travel to the match, they are adding extra services between Glasgow Central and Mount Florida, which is the closest station to the stadium. On top of that, the rail firm has warned regular travellers to be aware that services between the two stations will be much busier than normal before the game. After the clash, the travel company is advising fans to make their way back to Mount Florida as quickly as possible after the final whistle. Customers are also reminded that Mount Florida Station can only be accessed from Cathkin View Road and onto Bolton Drive via Clincart Road after the match. Additionally, due to ScotRail's temporary timetable, rail users are being urged to plan ahead and check their journeys. Phil Campbell, ScotRail Customer Operations Director, said, We're looking forward to helping fans travel by train to watch the men's national team play Poland at Hampden Park on Thursday night. We're adding more train services between Glasgow Central and Mount Florida to help supporters travel to and from the match, and we'll have additional staff on hand to help. Our advice to customers is to leave extra time for travel, as trains are likely to be busier than normal. Buying tickets in advance through our M-Ticket system will reduce your queuing time. Regular commuters who travel home from Glasgow on the line via Mount Florida should be aware that services will be much busier than normal with fans heading to the match. A spokesperson for the travel firm added, Extra staff will be on hand to make sure everything goes smoothly and the train operator is also reminding everyone that the canning and consumption of alcohol is prohibited on ScotRail trains and in ScotRail stations. This article is by Ben Waddle. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service. <laughs>